Good morning. Good morning. My name is Hannah. I get the joy of being your pastor here at Swickley United Methodist Church. Um, and it is interesting every Sunday to see um, which side of the church we're sitting on. You know, I think last Sunday we actually had an anomaly. You had more people over there last Sunday. It was pretty good. Um, but, but we're heavy over here on this side this Sunday. Um, but it doesn't matter where you sit. Yeah, I would even uh, encourage you to switch it up every once in a while. That kind of engages your worship senses. It kind of puts you outside your comfort zone a little bit, which makes you a little bit more aware of your surroundings. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good practice to get into. But regardless of where you're sitting, where you've come from, where you're going, I am glad that you are here and together we get to worship. And I also want to um, praise the Lord for a new microphone that we are going to be assured does not spend the service staticky um, and for the people who have put it together for us and made sure that it works. So we are grateful this morning. With a heart of gratitude, let us stand together to worship our God. Only the hungry search for bread. Only the thirsty look for water. This is a place for those who are hungry and thirsty in spirit. Only those who ache for meaning will pursue it. Only those who yearn, yearn for deeper life will seek it. This is a place for those who ache and yearn for something more. So let us come here today with our hunger and thirst. and let the God of life satisfy our souls. Please stand for hymn number 407.
sitting and as comfortable. Uh, share the peace with your fellow congregants. Please remain standing uh, for the prayer of confession. Jesus, cleanser of temples and souls, at this point in the Lenten journey, look deep within our hearts and our lives and clear away all that holds us back. May, May our minds, spirits, and bodies be a temple that is open to your presence. And may our words and our actions be transparent to your love and truth. In a moment of silence, we set before you and name those things for which we seek your cleansing and healing, so that we may be more faithful disciples. Amen. Amen. child to come forward. I know we had another one. Is she out there? Uh, so um, you are all on your lonesome today. This is so unusual. You know what? We're going to teach the congregation something today. How about that? Can you help me hold these up? All right. We're going to stand over here. And we're going to talk to them about our prayers. Let's see. Are they in the right order? Our Father, thy kingdom. Okay, you hold yours there. Yep, and then that one goes last. Good. Okay, perfect. So, can you help me? We're going to say this together. Okay? You think we can do that? Or do you want to see them? You want me to hold them for you? What do you think? Should we set them here so we can look at them? Do you need, okay, okay, ready? We'll do this, we'll do it like this, ready? We'll read it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, let's have a seat. Let's talk about that last one there. Okay. Lead us not into temptation. Do you know that when I'm leading that prayer, 
I always want to make sure that I am very clear to articulate, lead us not into temptation. Because if you don't articulate it, you know what it sounds like? Lead us not. You know how often I think I say the word snot while I'm praying? Yeah. Lead us not into temptation. So tell me, do you ever have temptations? Yeah? What kind of things tempt you? Fruit rolls? Fruit bowls. Oh, fruit balls. Oh, okay. And you really wanted one? Did you want them even when you weren't allowed to have them? Did you actually eat one when you weren't allowed to eat it? No. Oh, that's Only good. Only when you ask, okay. Is there ever anything that you do when you are not allowed to do it? Okay, so you... Okay, that's a temptation in our house, too. So you wanted to play Nintendo more than clean your room and went downstairs instead of cleaning your room. Yeah, we, you know what? Our Nintendo Switch just broke. <gasps> it's like the world is falling apart, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, we all have temptations we deal with. We all have things that we really want to do even though we know we shouldn't do them or things we, we do end up doing regardless of what the consequence might be. But yeah, that's temptations. But, but our temptations aren't necessarily all evil. You know, going and playing Nintendo because you'd rather do that instead of cleaning your room, that's not necessarily evil. So it says we're asking God... Right, it's just annoying to our parents. Yes, it is. You're right. So, and lead us not into temptation. We're asking God, please help us to be strong, right? Don't lead us into temptation. But then the other part is, but deliver us from evil. You know, there are things in the world that are evil. There are things that are bad and might hurt a whole lot of people that are outside of our control. So we're asking God to not just keep us safe from ourselves, and our own temptation, but also to keep us safe from evil. What does it mean to deliver something? What is... You're right. You are absolutely right. We deliver mail, right? We deliver it from one place to another. When we are delivered from evil, we are, we are taken out of that evil and placed somewhere else, which that somewhere else would be in the safety of God. So we are asking God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Next week, we have our final poster. Our last one, we're going to finish up the Lord's Prayer, and then on Palm Sunday, all of us kids are going to know it, right? And we're going to all say it together. But will you pray with me now? Dear Jesus, thank you for saving me from myself. And thank you for saving me from evil. Amen. Oh, man. Thank you very much. You did a good job up here by yourself. Scripture reading today is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to a place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the word of God for the people of God. St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It will be at six o'clock and I will be bringing the message for us tonight. Um, we continue to have a wonderful time of fellowship together and to eat um, some really good food afterwards. And it's, it's just really been a great way um, to spend this Lenten season with each other. But if you have not made it to any of them, time is not out yet. We are still gathering with our siblings from other congregations. Today is UMCOR Sunday. You did see a video last week about UMCOR Sunday um, and about the importance of UMCOR both locally, nationally, and internationally. Their, their reach is far and deep. And this Sunday particularly, all funds will go to paying for pretty much the overhead cost, the operation cost of UMCOR Sunday, so that the other monies that you give to UMCOR throughout the year goes all directly to the particular causes in which you are supporting. Um, so we know that this is an important day, an important thing to give to as well. And uh, last, just another way to support our life here, our time here together, is to purchase Easter flowers. Um, the deadline is coming up to be able to purchase those flowers, just like poinsettias. When you purchase them, they get to uh, beautify our church space here and, and help us to worship even deeper, uh, to engage all of our senses, which is the value of them. Um, and then you can take them with you to your Easter celebrations and, or take 
take them to shut-ins or give them um, to neighbors. They're, they're just a wonderful gift to not just keep for ourselves here, but to give away also. Um, you know that there are many ways you can give. You will see that in your announcements, your time, your resources, and of course your uh, financial blessings as well, which is between you and God. And so I'll pray that um, you may find it in your heart and in your relationship with God to give financially to this community and the work that is being done here um, and to uh, your gratefulness for what Christ has done for you. Will you please give your tithes and offerings as we receive mats? for your blessings you have poured out upon us, for your presence here with us, for the reality of your power in our lives. Lord, for the places in which you are at work within us that we don't even know about yet, for the people that you are at work within to bring into this space that have not yet come and they don't even know about yet. Lord, for those who are here, for those who are online, for those who are in need of you to just pour out upon them in a way that is unique to their spirit and to their circumstances of life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we know you are good and we know you are there and active and at work and that you call us to participate in that work. Lord, that you call us to raise our voices. You call us to lift our hands. You call us, Lord, to put one foot in front of the other and to take your word and the good news of your gospel message into the world. So, Lord, we do ask that you use us. You use us and our gifts and our resources, our time and our money. You use us, Lord, to bring you glory, 
You take whatever it is that we give, you multiply it, you use it to bring you glory, to further your kingdom here on this place. That the things that are so outside our control, the evils that are knocking on our doorstep, the war, the natural disasters, Lord, that take so much but don't give. Lord, the hurts of addiction and darkness and broken relationships of abuse. Lord, that those things don't have the final say in our lives, but it is our hope in you. Lord, let us to stand firm in the knowledge and truth of who you are as we lift our voices one with another as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Anywhere you can find a spot. Good morning. Um, some of you may be raising an eyebrow while there's Billy Joel and um, another song here together for the anthem. Uh, I'm a Billy Joel fan, as you all know. Um, <laughs> This particular song is called Everybody Has a Dream. So what I've done is I'm doing the verses from the song and then letting the choir do Goodness is Stronger Than Evil, which is found in our We Faith We Sing book. And if you want to look at that, it's number 2219. This particular song, since it's Lent, um, I think Mr. Joel was uh, very introspective here. I'm just going to read you a little bit of the lyrics. While in these days of quiet desperation, as I wander through the world in which I live, I search everywhere for some new inspiration, but it's more than cold reality can give. If I need a cause or celebration or a comfort I can use to ease my mind, I rely on my imagination and I dream of an imaginary time. And then the choir is singing, Goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate, light is stronger than darkness, life is stronger than death. The second verse, I believe, if I believe in all the words I'm saying, if a word from you can bring a brighter day, all I have are these games I've been playing to keep my hope from crumbling away. Let me lie, let me go on sleeping, I will lose myself in palaces of sand. All the fantasies I've been keeping will make the empty hours easier to stand. Goodness is stronger than evil. So I think it really fits perfectly with Lent. I know Lent is supposed to be, as me, a good Catholic boy, uh, growing up, very introspective and thinking about all the things that we have done wrong. But, you know, that's what reflection is supposed to be about. But victory is stronger than evil. Goodness is stronger than evil. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through him who loved us. You'll hear the choir sing. Goodness is strong. 
I really don't have to preach now, right? You just did that for us. That was good. Amen. I have to know, did you put, did you put that together? Was that, yeah, that was my little that was, creation. That was great. Yeah, that was like that was meant for each other. It was perfect. Well done. Well, I just ask that you continue um, in an attitude of worship and prayer as we bow our hearts together. Lord, we are here. We are yours. In these moments, we ask, Lord, that you may draw us closer to you, closer to one another, to the truths you have us know. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart is acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I am about to set up this sermon. If you'll notice, kind of the style that I often preach is I always do a setup, right, for the message. I am about to do the sweetest setup you have ever heard for a sermon before. I have to say, last week, I had some of the best dessert that I have had in a long time. Peach cobbler. It was so good. Our time of worship last Sunday evening for our ecumenical uh, service together, Leap of Faith was so good in leading us in the music and the word and Reverend Rankin's message. It was impassioned and on point. And to top it all off, we were fed by the Nurture Committee, Peach Cobbler, and sent home happy and complete heart, mind, and soul. At least I felt that way when I left here at the end of the night. It really was a good night together. And if I may admit, if I was the one cleaning up that pan of peach cobbler at the end of the night, you probably would have walked in on me eating every last crumb. Because when something is that good, 
even the crumbs are satisfying. You're going to get it here in a moment how that was a setup for our message. As we go to Matthew 15, 21 through 28, where we find out about how one woman's humility leads her to accept even the crumbs and saves her daughter from the devil and her house from hell. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. This passage is rich, but you have to do some digging to get there. At first read, it would seem as if this is not the Jesus you learn about in Sunday school. Right? This is not the Jesus that says, go into all of the world, that died for all people, that says, let the children come to me. This is the, I like to flip tables, Jesus, and ignore yelling women, Jesus. We don't like to talk much about this, Jesus. He, quite frankly, makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Now, we are used to the disciples doing and saying some pretty stupid things, but not Jesus. So what exactly is going on here? When reading scripture, one of the things that is important to pay attention to is the geography in which the people are at. This gives us a clue. From the very first line of our passage, we get a hint about what is going on here. Jesus left that place, that place being Galilee, and went to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus and his disciples, they were traveling through Galilee, working with all of the Jews, doing some really amazing things, and they left and went to, of all places, Tyre and Sidon. They were now in Gentile territory. And not just Gentile territory, but the territory of those who worship the god Baal. I bet his disciples were wondering what they were doing there. Just to give you a little further background of how out of place Jesus was, Tyre and Sidon were the cities in which Jezebel had come from in 1 Kings 16. She was a Phoenician princess who married King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel. To some success, she introduced and led the Israelites, led those who were followers of the one and only God to worship Baal. Obviously, this did not sit well with God. She was eventually destroyed by being pushed out of a window to her death. You will see from this map here, and I, I'm sorry, I wish it was a little bit bigger and more visible for you, but there's a big blue spot on that map. That blue spot there that is right up against the Mediterranean Sea is the kingdom of Israel. That is Jewish territory. But if you go further north and right there, you'll see the Phoenician states, that little strip of orange land right there. That is where Tyre and Sidon are. They literally left the territory of the Jews, the kingdom of Israel. They were out of place. 
And to deepen the contrast to the Jews, the disciples were used to working with, the woman who approaches them is actually a Canaanite woman. In Genesis 9, after Noah gets off the ark, he goes into a tent and drinks a little too much wine. He is drunk and naked, and his son Ham goes in and finds him laying that way. And instead of concealing his father, covering him up, and keeping his dignity, Ham exposes him and brings about his shame. He exposes him to Noah's other sons, other sons. And because of this, Noah curses Ham and his youngest son, whose name was Canaan. The Canaanites, they originally inhabited that which was the promised land, that which was the area that God had given to the Israelites, that God had taken over for them and driven out the Canaanites or killed them off. Any further reference of Canaan or the Canaanites within the Old Testament was done in relation to religious idolatry, immoral behaviors, and pagan rituals. Jesus was so out of place. Like he wasn't just a a little toe out of place. He He was way out of place from where he was supposed to be. We're going to ignore for a moment, to even deepen this fact a little bit more, we are going to ignore for a moment the fact that Jesus ignores the woman who is approaching them and shouting and look for a moment at his response to her. When he does finally address her, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then what in the world are you doing? in Tyre and Sidon because the lost sheep of the house of Israel were not there. Those were not the people he was sent to. Was it for this woman specifically? Because we hear nothing more about his time there. It says he came from Galilee and after this little interlude of a story, he goes back to Galilee, him and the disciples. There is something here. There is something that we are meant to know about and pay attention to. Jesus doesn't just, whoops, find himself in unfamiliar territory because he accidentally stumbled into another region. Jesus has intention, and you can bet that Jesus' intentions are always for the greater purpose of the kingdom of God. Yes, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. But I believe that what Jesus is doing in this moment is he is telling his disciples to pay attention. This is not just a brief time of reprieve from the work that we are meant to do. This is a part of the work that you all are going to carry on once I have passed on from this world, once I have resurrected and gone into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. This is an extension of the work that you are meant to do. Pay attention. Faith in me is found in places that you would never imagine or dare to go. Faith in me is found in people that you might not think would be the ones to have faith. Unfortunately, as we see from the response of the disciples and from uh, these very people who are self-proclaimed followers of Jesus, the ones whom Jesus is drawing our attention to in this moment are the very ones we too often push away. But Jesus has work to do with the disciples, and this is what he is doing. You know, the thing about this woman is we don't know anything about her. Right? We don't, we don't know anything about her life except for what is speculated. It could be assumed that she is a worshiper of Baal, being a Canaanite and being from the regions of Tyre and Sidon, but we don't actually know that. But we could assume that because after all, they were known to dabble in pagan rituals that often played with the demonic. 
She is here asking for mercy for her. Hey, notice that language, Jesus, have mercy on me. Her daughter is the one that is possessed by a demon, yet she is saying, have mercy on me. Is that because she dabbled with the demonic a little bit too close to home and she is the reason that the demon has come in the first place? Or is it because as a parent, we feel the pain of our children? But she says, help me. Have mercy on me. We can assume something else about her, though, that she also knows something about Jesus. She goes to him and the disciples, knowing that she would probably be turned away because who was she that they would do this thing for her? But it didn't matter who she was because she knew who he was and she knew what he could do for her. We at least know that this is a woman of great humility and a woman who loved her daughter. She came to understand that one of the best ways to be a good mom is to not allow hell to exist within her home. She was going to do something about that, but she could not do it on her own. She needed help. She needed the enemy of hell. She needed Jesus. So, I like what we see from her. It shows a fierceness, with a fierceness that comes from a protective mom. She rises up, and she shouts, and she refuses to go away until she gets what she wants. She comes up against the obstacles and public humiliation. We can well assume that this is not done in a private place, that there are others who are seeing this happen. Yet she is ignored by Jesus. She is pushed away by the disciples. And then continuing to beg, she bows down in despair. And she is told by the one who she knows has the ability to save her daughter, my ministry is not for you. It just keeps piling up. And yet we see her push on. She would have understood well what God says to her, or excuse me, what Jesus says to her next. How fair would it be to take the food from my children and to give it to the dogs? As a mother, she would have understood what Jesus meant when he was saying that. And as a non-Jew who might have given in to idolatry, she also would have understood the slander that was in that phrase. In that phrase, and give it to the dogs, it feels like Jesus pretty much just slapped her. Like this just would have seemed like the final blow for anybody else in, in, a, in a state of desperation such as this to get that final hit. And that would have brought about some fierce anger. Those who were involved in pagan rituals, those who worshipped other gods, they were referred to as dogs. It was a derogatory, sort, a derogatory statement that was just made. When it seemed like it couldn't get any worse, this Jesus who she turned to for help, he put that on her. Yet, she says, yes, Lord. She doesn't get angry. She doesn't rise up. She doesn't continue to shout. She shows shows some great humility. Yes, Lord, you are right, Lord. I know who I am. I know what I have done. We will never be able to get help from the problems in which we face if we cannot admit that there is, first of all, a problem. And that maybe, oftentimes, that problem is us. Yes, Lord, you are right. Yet, this is the greatest line, Yet, even, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She is met with resistance after resistance for this desperate cry in her heart. Yet she calls him Lord. She calls him 
king of David, a title that only those faithful, only those Jews would use for him. She calls him master. And even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. When something is as good as Jesus, even the crumbs are satisfying. She wasn't there stroking his ego. She was speaking truth. Jesus wasn't bringing her low. He was taking the opportunity to show the disciples what faith looked like. He was presenting the space for there to be proof that it does exist in those who you consider to be dogs, who you consider to be Gentiles, who you consider to be pagan, the lowest of the lows, even them. We needed, he needed the disciples to understand this message. This passage, it takes us through a whirlwind of emotion. I mean, we feel bad for this woman. We want to rise up and defend this woman like, Jesus, what are you doing here? But if those disciples would not have been emotionally involved in this moment, they might not have understood the implications of what was happening. We needed this interlude because all the work that they have been doing is with the Jews. Jesus needed them to know the ones who were going to carry on the message. As he tells us in Matthew 20, to all the world, that all means all. He needed them to get it, that all, not just all the Jews, not just all of the people and all of the places that you will be at, but you are going to have to cross some borders. You are going to have to cross some boundaries. You are going to have to go into some places that you might consider unholy to share this good message. They needed to be emotionally involved and wrapped up in it. And the woman, her increasing show of humility, it led her to victory, right? And and in such a way that we have never seen before, Jesus says to her, from this moment, your daughter is healed. She doesn't say, wait a minute, stay here. I need to run home and check. And then I'm going to come back and I'll let you know if it really happened, right? She, She knows why she's there. She trusts this Jesus that she has gone to beg to. She has put herself in a place of humility because she knows the good that it was going to do. And that daughter was healed. Jesus never went there. Jesus never saw her. Jesus never touched her. We have never seen Jesus heal somebody else in this type of a way before. For somebody who was not considered one of the lost sheep of Israel. This thing has been done. When Jesus says it is so, it is so. If, if you knew how good that peach cobbler was, you would have settled for the crumbs that fell from the table. When we truly believe in the goodness of Jesus Christ, that he is Lord, and that he is King, we will settle for whatever we can get. And this is not like an unsatisfactory type of settling, like, okay, you know, I'll I'll get the last scoop of ice cream. It It is one that is good, because every little piece of Jesus is good and rich and just as full as the other. The problem is sometimes us. We don't believe that we deserve the crumbs. We believe that we deserve more. We believe we deserve the whole meal. We are a part of the house of God. We are God's children. We are worshiping and praying and giving our money to all of the right places and using our skills and resources for all of the right things. Right? We, we, are, we are in it, going through the motions as we are meant to do. We don't deserve the scraps. We deserve a seat at the table. 
After all, we're the ones who set it up and are tearing it down. But would you give up your piece of peach cobbler so someone else could experience how good it is? Would you give up your seat at the table so someone else could experience the fullness of the meal? Would you sit on the floor and eat the scraps so another doesn't have to go hungry? How deep does humility run within you? This woman had never even had the full meal, but she had heard about how good it was. And she knew that if the devil could exist within her daughter, if hell could exist within her home, then heaven could too. And she was going to make that happen, but she needed help. So she humbled herself. Even though the fault might have been hers, the entranceway to hell in her home might have come through her. She humbled herself. Help me, Lord. Help me. I know who I am, and I know who you are, and I need your help. After this Sunday, we have two more Sundays in our Lenten season before we get to Easter. And I pray that you are taking seriously the call to humility. We have been tasked so far with these three things. Practice wonder. Give something up for someone else. And be teachable. Those are the thing, three things we've had to work on so far. And I hope that you work on them even outside of our time together. Outside of the Easter season, the Lenten season. But this third one might really be the hardest one. Ask for help. You know, I have been so impressed since my time here at how many doers we have in this congregation. And you all have the skills and you put them to use. You are so good at doing so many things. However, I have learned, and I include myself in on this, but I've already known this about myself for a long time, we are not that good at asking for help. And, and I don't mean, let's put something in the bulletin that says we need volunteers, because that's pretty generic, right? Or, or the church needs your help, or the committee needs your help. Because those are also pretty generic. It takes the onus off of you. What about, look, I, I, have feel, I feel this call to lead this committee, but I need your help. Look, I have been called to lead this church, but I need your help. I need your help in leading worship. I need your help. With the, working with the children. I need your help to nurture others in their relationship with Jesus. I need your help to make sure that nobody leaves this, these doors without feeling like they've mattered, at least for this moment here today. It's a lot different when you say, I need help, please. Help me. It makes us feel vulnerable. It makes us question our own ability to be able to do these good things. We value independence. We value being able to do it on our own. But Jesus values asking for help. We were not meant to be an island to ourselves. We were never meant to do it alone. We were always meant to do it with others. And when we ask for help, it doesn't just make us vulnerable. It strengthens our bonds with one another and strengthens our community at work together. So I want you to ask for help this week. You'll see up here, and I don't just mean church help, right? I, I don't mean just go out if you're on a committee and ask for help there, although you can do that, but I believe we probably need help in our own personal lives as well. You'll see up here, last Easter, we made these rocks 
And on these rocks, we wrote some things that maybe we struggle with in our own lives or things that we would like to see happen in our own lives. And I just want to pick up a couple here. Um, Things we struggle with. Doubt. Our health. Or fear. Maybe you remember the thing that you put on a rock here last Easter. Um, And and I wonder, have you asked for help with those things yet? And I know sometimes it can feel like we have to climb a mountain to be able to get the help that we need, but we don't have to climb that mountain alone. Ask for help. Maybe you need help paying your bills. Maybe you need help finding a good psychologist. You need that resource. Maybe you need help with your health or help raising your kids. We all know we can use some help doing that. Ask for help. Not only are you valuing what Jesus has called us to, but you are valuing the worth of another. And that's a win-win for us all. Let us pray. Humble us, Lord. We know that we are loved. We know that you make us holy. We know, Lord. But we also know that without you, we are nothing. We need your help. Lord, guide us to those people and places that can give us the help and the deliverance that we seek in our lives from the things that taunt us, from the things that act as doorways to hell in our own homes. Lord, we need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing our closing hymn.
pray that as you go into the world, you are not afraid to show the power of God through the humility of your life. Ask for help. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.